The year is 1978. Lego just released its biggest, bestest, bangingest, newest theme out there. And it's late. Oh my god, they have castles. Oh my god, are those some nice? Those are some dragons. That's a horse. Except not really. Dragons wouldn't come out for a few years. I don't know if I would call that a horse. And if you're going to say that is a knight in shining armor, I'm going to say I have a successful YouTube channel. Fast forward a couple years to present day 2022 minus a few years. Lego's announced to the world we are going to celebrate in a big way our 90 year history. But we want you, yes, you, dear viewer, to tell us what we should make to represent the entire entire over-encompassing story arc of Lego. Now you might think answering the question what one set would best represent our entire 90 year history, what one thing could condense everything down and represent all of us might be a little bit difficult and you'd be right because they couldn't do it on their own so they asked us, yes us the audience that pays money for their product, what we, what, what, what should we do? Vote, vote now, tell us, what should, what, vote, 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 vote. So the loyal fans of the Lego Empire responded, sure daddy Lego, I'd love to pick a set to buy in the next couple years. What are our options? Oh, we got, we, we could buy a pirate ship. Maybe a spaceship, a castle ship, a bionicle. <laughs> if you haven't been able to guess already, castle one, yay. I don't know, I thought a set representing a bunch of different themes out there would have been more appropriate, like little builds of each one to have different categories of things. Oh my God, I could not have been more wrong. Fast forward a couple of years back to present day and we're here to celebrate the $400 release of a new castle set. Ouch! Now the new Lion's Knight Castle is a fine addition to anybody's collection. It's a damn good looking castle. There's there's a ton of knights, there's some horses in it, like real horses this time, and... Where's, where's the king? Now when I hear the word castle, there are a few words that instantly come to mind. Knights, medieval, queen, but most importantly, King, now how can a $400 set be sold to someone incomplete? This is an outrage that I and many other cannot stand. I spent my valuable time, dozens of hours, researching and finding all the potential suitors in all of LEGO's lineup to find who the best king would be for the new queen. <laughs> now, Queen Iona has quite a bit to offer outside of the medieval mindset that her body can produce an heir. Let's just assume that this set that she's coming in now is the only thing she has in her kingdom and not all of the other copious amounts of lion knights that are out there. At the very least, she has the best castle Lego has ever produced for the castle theme, up there with the likes of Fortrex, where it's a... a, a it's a castle <laughs> on, on tank treads. Honestly, this is what the video should be about. However, we see with our famous blue wizard visiting her, she has quite a few holes in her kingdom. The bell tower still hangs there, ready to warn the kingdom if the wolf pack shall ever return. What is this? A secret room and an escape plan from your dungeons? The forest men can just get in and out at their beck and call whenever they like! With soldiers trying to defend her life, currently sleeping on the crapper, and a secret entrance out in and out of your dungeons, in and out of the cave system underneath your castle that anybody can just go in whenever they want, raid and loot your panty drawer. Clearly, she's gonna need some help from an outside kingdom. We can't just have any random person coming along trying to claim their stake as king. There has to be some sort of royal procedure to figure that out. And with over 25 kings, we, we have a lot to weed through. There's the kingdom's Lion King, Porter's King, Ice King, Scorpion King. This is a douchebag right here, just seriously, right out of the list, expecting me to edit it and make it look good. I'm not gonna do that. So let's just, we're just gonna fast forward through this. And that's not even mentioning that, holy crap, we just started doing it again, so we don't have a bunch of irrelevant names. We're gonna fast forward through this and get to the rules. The rules to royal rumpus. Thou must beeth a bachelor, i.e. This king cannot already have a queen. We don't want some horn dog walking around leaving the old ball and chain back at home trying to taste some new fruit because he thinks it might be a little bit sweeter. Thou must beeth local. So in tender terminology, our max radius of finding new love is no more than like 25 miles. We are not driving out into the sticks to have a, a randall treat us to a good time. This isn't only meant to weed out the non-castle themes like something from Lord of the Rings or elves or King Achu from Adventurers. This is more so to squash any potential power unbalances, like something that might be a little bit too small or something that might be a little bit too big or something, God forbid, oh dear. Rule number three is thou loaded. We don't want some schmuck coming about with nothing backing him. Are you rich? How much land do you own? Is your military prowess anything worthwhile? She wants some side piece that she can fool around with at night. Go for it, you're a queen, do whatever you want. Fall in love, go to college, get a boyfriend. I don't care. I care about your tax policy and right now it's looking pretty sour and you're gonna need somebody to help you out when some other foreign military comes a knocking. 
Rule number four, would thou father approve? And it was only worded like that because I couldn't really write no incest out on a YouTube video, it probably would not go over well. We're gonna follow PLC's rule sets and assume that all of the lion factions, which there are many in the castle theme, are related in some way, whether it be by blood, bannermen, or whatever. Her position as a queen isn't really gaining anything if some cousin of hers is coming along like, yeah, this guy's good to bone. Rule number five, is thou a royal? Much like the aforementioned schmuck, we don't want some dirtbag coming in and claiming his titleship of king without having the credentials to back it. I would hope you want your Uber driver to have a license. So much like our Uber drivers, we want him to actually have some royal blood pumping through his veins. After cutting, trimming, and hedging away, we are left with a solid eight candidates. However, eight is too many. And unless you're trying to make a different kind of video, we gotta get rid of a few more. Another two, the Crazy King, the Flo de King, can be quickly nixed because they are broke pieces of crap. With the Crazy King being, you know, crazy, he only has two things to his name, a throne and a scepter. Shockingly, a Frenchman, the Flo de King, has even less than the Crazy King. Coming in a Toys R Us Booktober pack, he comes with a surprisingly, you guessed it, nothing. This might shock some of you, but the Ninja theme is actually an offshoot of the greater castle theme, but there is a bit of a hiccup. I'm gonna show you three minifigures and I want you to guess which one's leader, is it A? Bandit Chief, is it B, Ninja Master, or is it C, Samurai Shogun, or is it C, Samurai Shogun, or is it C, Samurai Shogun? Those two never stood a chance. Queen Lyona isn't gonna go with some vagabond or some geriatric ancient old person that likes to train young preteens. She's probably gonna go with one of the Shogun's actual leading rulers of Japan. But which one? All these dudes have a pretty good claim at being the, the lord of all other lords. The Shogun Warlord, well, he is lord in his name. The old blue Shogun, he's the wisest, most uh, intelligent Shogun that trained all other Shoguns. But then there's Shogun Lord, Lord of Shoguns. But then the Shogun Lords at defending the Emperor's Fortress. So there's an Emperor, which implies that at least one, if not all of these guys are under them. But it doesn't even matter because sometimes the samurais are helping each other, sometimes the ninjas are helping them, sometimes the ninjas are fighting them. The bandits are all over the place. I just don't think this made up country of hybrid Japan-China is in the right headspace right now to head over to Europe and help our queen. The Dwarf King at first glance might not seem like that bad of a matchup. He has quite a substantial military, a cave full of gems and other rare oddities, and some crazy machinery. But my issue with the Dwarf King being compatible with the Queen is his portrayal. You see all the dwarves walking around with these big old belt buckles like they just won first place in their local county rodeo, but hold on, that's a crown. That's King Brutus's royal crown insignia, which could only mean that they're, they're, they're working for the King, and not just the King, the King of Kings, the Crown King, the, the King with the, the, the crowns. With all of those contenders out of the way, we are left with four potential suitors. Unfortunately, one of these is not like the other, and in this case, it's not based on their morality of them being villains and not a good guy. Jocko is proving to be quite a thorn and not what he has to bring to the table. His offerings are quite impressive, except he doesn't fit our timeline. Welcome to the short synopsis of the Knight's Kingdom 2 History of Warfare, starring yours truly, nobody. I'm sure you are all just frothing at the mouths, waiting for me to go on a long-winded three-minute diatribe about a debunked LEGO themes made-up lore. Unfortunately, that'll take too much time and no one really cares. So I'm just gonna give it to you plain and simple. Three eras and the Knight's Kingdom timeline, the third era is far off in the future, while the other two are congruent with the other castle themes timeline. We know this because of a minifigure's description. You're welcome, I just saved you so much of your time. Why anyone would ever think any of that is confusing and not easy to figure out is beyond me. With the timeline discrepancies of King Jaco's reign, he's not really gonna fit in. Because of that, he has to leave. And Vladik gets to stay. All right. That leaves us with three potential suitors. The previously mentioned Lord Vladik, Cedric the Bull, and Basil the Batlord. Knowing a little bit of the background and a few tidbits of lore is fine and dandy and all, but when it really gets down to it, I want to know, down and dirty, playground rules, who's going down swinging, and who is going down like a big old chump. If you want to get down to it and boil down to the purest, simplest forms of just straight up hard hitting numbers, Cedric the Bull and Basil the Batlord come and tied at first place with 48 different things to fill out their vast array of military kingdom stuff, with Vladik not being far behind with 45. But those 45 to 48 different things are super varying and all over the place. How do you match up a dragon that shoots fiery fire at someone, or a catapult that shoots fiery fiery rocks at someone? I have lots of graphs comparing different numbers and stats, like Cedric the Bull has 28 people. How does 28 men go up against 
I don't know, four different types of Air Force military things that are shooting down at them. Cedric might have a lot of stuff, but he's not very defensible. He's all about the hard pushing attack. So if he had to retreat at some point, where is he gonna retreat? His one fort? Grass are not that easy. But what does it mean to be in possession of these expansive militaries and overwhelmingly huge kingdoms when you don't know the man that's running the whole operation? It's quite easy to compare two different numbers. Math is pretty darn objective. But when magic is involved, math isn't as concrete as it would normally be. There's a pretty significant gap between 26 people and 19 people, but let's say those 19 people have some sort of magic curse on them, making them much stronger or faster or smarter than their opponents. Then the matchup might not be so black and white. Taking an extended look at the leaders is pretty important. But, Lord Vladek, a top tier fighter by any recognition, he is on par with the most powerful magical users out there in the entire castle theme, being able to not only enhance himself, but his armor, his weapons, his siege, and his own units. He also has like some giant scorpions and gargoyles and little scorpions and stuff, and once he gets a hold on a magical relic, he is a real hard turd to put down. Prince Cedric the Bull, with genius tactics, not only with his way of attack, but also with his siege and his retreat, he is unmatched with some of his hit-and-run guerrilla warfare techniques. Being one of the most physically capable warriors across all of Castle, his hands are not only strong and powerful, but also his heart is soft and nurturing, as once he found an orphan boy and took him in under his wings and raised him to be a ruthless murderer. Basil the Batlord, being magically imbued, it's taken his skills to the next level. Being able to control from the smallest bats to the most ferocious dragons, he is feared both on land and sky. Unfortunately, being under the complete control of Wyalit, you do have a bit of a crazy mother-in-law situation on your hands. I could go on a little while longer explaining which one of these three goons would be in the most optimal position to help out our Queen Lyona achieve her goals and aspirations, but I don't think that would accurately represent a project that's been worked on and off for the last couple months and how weird it's become, so instead. How about we host a show about matchmaking and love? I'm too lazy to iron this shirt for this bit, and you're watching Medieval Magic. The rules are simple. I have some questions, and our lovely little lady over there, I'm sorry, our queen, gets to decide who should become her queen. On today's thrilling and only episode of the show, we have three lovely, gentle giants in the ring tonight. Ladies and gentlemen, these are some class acts well known across all of Castle. These three men have made a name for themselves unlike any other. Starting off, we have the Dark Lord Vlad, a strong proponent of starting his own thing by tearing down his best friend's kingdom and making it his own. Thank you for the opportunity to spread my message of what Vladek has in store for the world. Following up, we have Cedric the Bull, a long lost prince from a kingdom far, far away. We have a strong, independent, strapping young lad that wants nothing more to claim his spot in this world, start a kingdom by tearing down a close friend's kingdom. I'm just here to show how powerful Cedric the Bull really is, and maybe even win a queen along the way. And finally, but not lastly, we have Basil or if you prefer it, Basil the Bat Lord, leading his fearfully loyal Fright Knights into any heat of battle. He is an unstoppable force. The only thing corrupting his goodwill and nature are forces of evil and dark magic beyond our realm of comprehension. Hi, I'm Basil. You know, I'm supposed to be an unbiased third party, but it's looking like one of these guys are different from the other. Lord Vladek, I have some hard hitting questions. You have some opponents out there that would say some pretty not so great things about you, like you're a conniving little cheat that has wiggle wormed his way to the top. What would you have to say to them? Sure, I've heard the critiques throughout the years, but I'm someone that's passionate and driven and willing to do what it takes despite a few roadblocks that might be in the way. A man of dedication and willingness to do what it takes get what he wants. Now, that's an admirable trait. Now, Cedric, I have some unfortunate claims I've heard out there that you're willing to cheat and scheme and betray those that you hold dearly. What would you have to say to that? All I have to say is maybe I'd be a little bit better at running that putz King Leo's kingdom and show how strong the bull can really be. Now, that's a pretty admirable trait. Willing to stop at nothing to get what you want. I, I can respect that hustle. Basil, some people out there want to claim that you're just using Wyla as an excuse. You're not really under her spells and you're just 
using that as a lie to do really terrible things. What do you have to say about that? No, it's really true. She uses magic to manipulate me. That's really true. He's really a good man at heart, and he's just being manipulated by forces we cannot simply comprehend to do terribly evil acts. If only he had someone to help guide him through all of this. Now, I have one question for all the potentially former bachelors here tonight. Why are all of you so rotten to the core and would betray your closest allies for just a little bit of recognition? Having the perseverance to take over someone else's kingdom should be applauded, not, not villainized. It's not my fault. When my father died, he split his kingdom up between my 12 siblings and gave me nothing. I, I, had, to get a, I had to get rule somehow. I never betrayed anyone and I have no reason to do so and my past reflects that. Wait, you all betrayed your king? Someone you swore to protect and serve with absolute loyalty? I needed to. I, I needed to, uh, uh... And what's stopping you from doing that to me? I never betrayed anyone. And it looks like we have a true love that's found its way into the hearts of anyone here. Isn't it just beautiful? Oh man, I hope it's not lost on people the absurdity of finding romantic partnership with two different made up mini figures.